Welcome to Paranormal Yakko. You are invited to join me, your host, Stan Mallow, each week when I interview a different guest of note in their respective field. The unexplained, the mysterious, the macabre, UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena. We explore them all on Paranormal Yakker. Hi, everyone. I'm Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yakker. My guest on today's show is Chetan Noir, author and researcher of the paranormal, cryptozoology, and pagan fields. She teaches courses on the paranormal history of the Great Lakes, wrote several books on cryptozoology, and is a much sought after lecturer. Chetan also writes for several paranormal and cryptozoology based magazines and is a specialist in paranormal travel destinations and legend trip investigations. I'll be talking with her about her book, Flying Creatures of the Midwest Beyond the Mothman. Chetan Noir, welcome to Paranormal Yakker. Thank you for having me on the show today. I look forward to our conversation. When, Chetan, did you first become interested in cryptozoology and what sparked that interest? For me, it started the summer that I was, I think, nine or 10 years old. My family liked to go camping as our summer vacation trip. So that particular summer, we decided to go to a campground called Crystal Lake. Not any association with Jason. It was a nice campground, Crystal Clear Lake to go fishing in. The only problem was they had a six foot alligator in a dog kennel right next to the gift store. And it was a real living, breathing, will eat you alligator or crocodile. Not quite sure, but they probably brought it up from Florida and just thought, hey, this is a cool thing. So while we were there that summer, they decided that a wonderful movie to show, actually a couple of movies to show for family movie night would be the Patterson Gimlin film and The Legend of Boggy Creek. As a nine-year-old child watching this on the screen, having them discuss that it, you know, these were real creatures and this was real footage with the Patterson Gimlin film that they were showing, that totally freaked me out. Next thing I know, I'm hiding in the women's bathroom. Two very nice older women escorted me back to our truck camper. And after that, it became a thirst for knowledge on anything I could get. At that time, everything was new age. It was Fate Magazine subscriptions and the chapter books that had like a chapter on one would be on Loch Ness, one would be on Bigfoot, one would be on Atlantis, UFOs and things of that nature. And just consuming as much as I could. Of course, that was 20 some years ago before we had the internet. Now everybody has the luxury of cryptozoology shows and UFO shows and paranormal shows. And that wasn't the case for teenage me. Um, That was a lot of book reading and library trips, trying to discern what knowledge was out there. And so that is what started my interest into cryptozoology. For centuries, humans have shared their world with flying creatures of all kinds. Your book provides provides a detailed look at the fossil records of them and gives each creature's history. You also include witness reports and interviews with leading experts. I'll now ask you about some of the creatures featured in the book. What, uh, Shatan, can you tell me about the pterosaurs, the legendary flying reptiles believed to be cousins of the dinosaur? The flying reptiles, the pterosaurs that I have listed in the book, are only the North American species, which covers about 180 different species that we had at various times throughout Earth's history here in North America. Now, my book, Flying Cryptids of the Midwest, does focus primarily on the Midwest, but with the knowledge that flying cryptids can go anywhere, it was easier to look at North America as a whole for the pterosaurs than just try to focus in on a small area with the knowledge base that the Western Interior Sea ran from the Gulf of Mexico up to British Columbia. And that that was a major pathway for both flying reptiles, such as your pterosaurs, your pterodactyls, quexoclodilus, and also your marine reptiles, such as plesiosaurs and mosasaurs, your giant sharks, all types of fish species. A lot of your pterosaurs are actually fish eaters, and this provided them with a prime habitat to live and thrive in. So when you're looking at that many different species of flying reptiles, of, of pterosaurs, Certainly you can pick out a few that are your favorites, but it's a very vast categories. One of my favorites is, of course, Quetzalcoatlus, who was one of the biggest pterosaurs with a 
wingspan that would have rivaled a Cessna airplane. Thunderbirds play a prominent role in Native American mythology. How do they view the Thunderbird and what role does it play in their mythology and belief system? The Native Americans version of the Thunderbird is a benevolent Manitou. Manitou is a spirit. Thunderbirds were thought to be protectors of the human race and they were the nemesis, the arch enemy of the great underwater panther who was a very evil spirit towards human beings. The Thunderbird's job was to protect the human race from the great underwater panther, but it was also the bringer of the sun would lead them to game to hunt. Each Native American tribe has a different variation of their association with the Thunderbird if they associate with the Thunderbird. And so there are at least a hundred different tribes in the Great Lakes area, in the Midwest area, that may or may not have a story associated with the Thunderbirds. So primarily the Thunderbird was a very benevolent, very protective spirit for the Native Americans. What can you tell me about the legendary half reptile, half bird, Snallygaster? The Snallygaster is a interesting creation myth. It was created by the moonshiners in the Appalachian Mountains to keep the law enforcement out of the local area, to keep snoops out of the area. And they created this story of this creature that would eat human beings whole and blew fire and made these bellowing noises. Well, to operate a moonshine, you need to have fire and you need to have these big kettles. And sometimes they make big booming noises. Sometimes you've got steam coming out of the mountains. Sometimes you have smoke and fire coming out of the mountains. Depends on what you were brewing and depends on what your combustibles were. And so the Snallygaster became a way of explaining that all way, but of keeping things protected for the moonshiners, a way of them carrying on with what they were doing, kind of pulling the wool over local law enforcement's eyes. Uh, gargoyles are considered by some to ward off evil spirits, while others believe them to be demonic vessels. What Shatan has your research found out about them? Are they the good guys or the bad guys in the cryptid universe? Gargoyles, when we're talking about gargoyles as decorative ornaments for buildings, cathedrals, castles, they are protective. They are usually the water spout for rain let off, and they're viewed as a protective element. But the Butler County gargoyle that I feature in my book, that's not the impression that people who have encountered it gotten. Their experiences have been both terrifying and mind-blowing because they have encountered, some people think it's a statue as they drive past it and then they watch it fly off. That can ruin your day really fast when you think you're looking at a great Halloween decoration and suddenly, nope, it's, it's a living, breathing thing and it's flying and you have just experienced that, you've just witnessed that. Really, there's no explanation for it. So the brick and mortar or limestone or marble marble or concrete versions of gargoyles, I would say are protective in that they are fierce looking and might scare people off. But the real ones that people have encountered, I don't think that they're beneficial to the human race. I think they might actually be a detriment to the human race and be something that people are not necessarily prepared to experience or encounter. Well, where do winged humanoids factor in the mysterious world of flying creatures? They are definitely a part of the cryptid phenomenon. They are also possibly extraterrestrial. We don't quite know because there's nothing in the fossil record other than pterosaurs and birds that point to this being a possibility. We could very well be looking at creatures that are interdimensional, that are alien in nature, and are just coming to Earth to witness what human beings are doing and keep track of the human race to watch how we develop mentally, technology, and what we do with those once we we have them with flying humanoids such as mothman gargoyles lizard men anything that you know is a flying cryptid humanoid you know there's that question mark there of what are they and where are they coming from i think the interdimensional aspect is probably as good of an answer as we're going to get for where these actually come from well your book shatan does indeed cover flying creatures beyond mothman it also includes mothman which is undoubtedly one of the most well-known cryptids. I'm curious to know about two of them. Firstly, what can you tell me about the Lake Michigan Mothman? I don't put a whole lot of stock into the Lake Michigan Mothman just because I think some of the reports that have been taken
taken in on it are hope probably not legitimate reports. I think it's somebody who is either trying to build a case file or somebody who's having a very good time at pulling the wool over investigators' eyes. I know personally, I have friends who have gone and researched each one of the supposed encounter locations. They have put up some red flags on was it possible for this creature to be flying? I mean, one of the reports is at the international airport right there out of outside of Chicago. If you have a flying cryptid of human size flying through the air at an international airport, security is going to be called, national military is going to be called. It's going to be a much bigger deal than just somebody phoning in a report or emailing in a report. I kind of question the Lake Michigan Mothman. There is talk of it. There is investigations into it. So there is the chapter in my book about the Lake Michigan Mothman, but I don't necessarily put a whole lot of stock in that one. Now, the West Virginia one, I do. And that was my next question to you. What can you tell me about the West Virginia Mothman? The West Virginia Mothman, I actually just got back from the Mothman Festival that was this past weekend, and it is a huge event. 25,000 people there on just Saturdays. It's a huge event, but you've got the Mothman Museum there. You've got the Mothman Tours. You have people who have uh, had eyewitness encounters with this creature. There is so much documentation of people's interactions with this creature during that five-year um, flap, you know, right before the Silver Bridge collapsed there in uh, Point Pleasant, that people were seeing something. They were experiencing something. And then you've got the factor of the men in black who are showing up and trying to hush people up. And obviously that didn't work because 25,000 people are showing up for a festival celebrating the Mothman. Apparently they didn't do their job very well of keeping Mothman hush hush. But just from the eyewitness reports, just from the sightings that people had, overall uniqueness of the Mothman phenomenon, I would say that people were experiencing things because before the Silver Bridge class, before the four teenage couples got chased back into town in their car, people in the farmland, the rural communities around Point Pleasant were experiencing something. And it was to the point where as soon as it started turning dust, they were locked into their houses and they didn't let their kids go outside until the sun was well into the sky. And they let the schools know, we're not letting our kids walk to the bus stop while it's still dark out because there's something out here. The police weren't taking it seriously. The local farmers, the local community and the rural areas were because livestock was going missing. People were hearing and seeing things moving around in the wood. They were seeing the red glowing eyes. They were hearing something growling at them. And it was to the point where when people are locking themselves in their houses at night and not coming out until the sun is in the sky the next morning, that's an indication that people are experiencing something. And it was wasn't until Mothman started to move towards town and people started to experience it from that point of view that suddenly, oh, yes, we, we certainly have a situation on our hands. My next question, uh, you've already answered earlier, half of it, now for the other half. And that was about your favorite flying creature. If you had Aladdin's magical lamp, Satan, and were told that by rubbing the lamp, the genie in it would conjure up and bring to life for you two legendary flying creatures, which ones would they choose and why. You already said earlier about one of them. Who would that second one be? Definitely my first one would be Oxycodal Neuropia, the giant pterosaur. And I guess my my second one would probably be the Butler County Gargoyle, just because I do like gargoyles. I think it would be cool to see a nine foot tall gargoyle and just to know that they do exist. Great. Should viewers of Paranormal Yakker want to buy flying creatures of the Midwest beyond more Mothman, or any of your other books, learn about events you'll be at and other projects in which you are involved. How can they do that? All of my publications, all of my books can be found on Amazon just by typing in Swatch GQ, and that will bring up everything that I offer for my books. Or you can type in my name, Shatan Noir, and that might bring up my books in that I've authored personally. Definitely, you know, check those out to so keep track of what I'm doing and 
where I'm going to be. You can find me on Facebook under Shatan Noir, uh, S-H-E-T-A-N-N-O-I-R. Um, so if you Google those or Amazon search or uh, Facebook search those, then you will find those. You'll find me you and keep track of what I'm up to. Shatan Noir, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. Yakking with you has been most informative. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yakker. I hope you enjoyed the interview you just watched so that you don't miss any upcoming shows. Be sure to subscribe to my free YouTube channel. To do that, just press the subscribe button on your screen. I very much appreciate your support of my channel and thank you for subscribing to it. Thank you.